You do realize, don't you, that uh, you have one week less of life today than what you had this time last week? Now, I just made your day to know making that statement. But it's true. It is true that we have one week less than what we had this time last week. We have one day less than what we had this time yesterday. Uh, the sands of, of time are certainly slipping on through and time's running out. And that's not bad news, by the way. God's plans are, are wonderful. God's plans are great. And for us as children of God, we rejoice in the fact that it's not going to be like this for eternity. As much as we are enjoying this day, as much as we are enjoying the service right now, I tell you, when we get to heaven, we're going to all be glad this is in our past. Uh, it's going to be a whole lot better for us when we see the Lord and when we are uh, with Him. And so, and so time as we know it is one of these days going to be gone. And this day and age of the New Testament church is one day coming to an end when Jesus comes for His bride. When Christ returns for His church, then, then this type of thing is going to be no more. And the bride of Christ will be with our Lord there in heaven. The Apostle Peter writes in 1 Peter about the fact that all of this is indeed coming to an end. And uh, under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, the Apostle Peter instructs us on how we ought to be living with this understanding. Knowing that, that the time of all things is, is, is coming to an end and, the, and this day and age is passing. How you and I should be living. And so that's what we're looking at. We began looking at our text last week and then we're going to, to pick up this morning with a second thought from uh, our scripture. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7, Now the end of all things is near. And as I pointed out last week, he's not talking about uh, something being immediate as much as he is that it is that he's talking about something being imminent. The end of all things is looming. It's a looming reality. It's on the front porch. We don't know when the door is going to swing open, but the end of all things is on the front porch. It's a looming reality. And I tell you, that is wonderful news for all of those who have repented of their sin and put their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's wonderful news for us. That may cause us a little bit of reservation because we don't know how all that's going to happen and how life's going to come for, to an end for us as individuals. And so there's, there's a little bit of reservation in our heart. But I tell you, it is wonderful news for us who know Christ as our Savior and Lord that the end of all things is at hand. The Bible says in Titus chapter 2 verse 13 that you and I are those who wait for the blessed hope the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we have a certain joyful anticipation as we think about the Lord Jesus coming for His church and the Lord Jesus Christ coming for us. The Apostle Paul, in writing to the church of Philippi, said in Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21, that our, our living, our place of citizenship, our conversation, as it's put in the King James text, our living, our citizenship is in heaven. And so we are citizens of a place that we don't really live in right now. Our citizenship is in heaven. From where we look for the Lord Jesus. We're looking for Him. We are anticipating His return. We look for the Lord Jesus who shall change, and the King James uses, uses this word, our vile bodies, that they might be fashioned like unto His glorious body. Don't you know that God is amused at the way that we think we're so pretty? <laughs> the Bible says that, that our bodies here in this world that's so marred by sin, they're just vile bodies. And so we, we uh, will realize that we didn't have much to brag about and boast about when we get to heaven and we find out what real beauty is. 
I tell you, the Lord's going to do a great work on all of us to transform us and to get us away from creation that is so marred by sin. I think all the angels laugh at all of our beauty pageants. You know, our vile bodies. The Lord's going to come and He's going to fix everything that sin has so messed up with us by the redeeming work of the Lord Jesus Christ that will be seen in all of its fullness. And so this truth here in verse 7 of 1 Peter chapter 4 is wonderful news for all of us who know Christ as our Savior and Lord. But I tell you, it is dreadful news for those who have not bowed to the Lord Jesus Christ. It is dreadful news for them. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 2 and 3, the Bible says this, For you yourselves know very well that the day of the Lord you see, when Christ comes for His church, that's the opening up of the door of the day of the Lord, the day of God's judgment. The days of tribulation, the days of God's wrath and judgment coming. For you yourselves know very well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. The imminence of the day of the Lord before us in this verse of Scripture. When they say, peace and security... Then sudden destruction comes on them like labor pains on a pregnant woman and they will not escape. That's a dreadful reality for those who do not know the Lord Jesus. I tell you, the only way to escape the holy wrath and judgment of God is to be in Christ. That's the only way to escape. Christ is the only safety in relationship to God's holy judgment. And when God's judgment comes, it's not going to be an enjoyable experience for those who do not know Christ as their Savior. In 2 Peter chapter 3, and verse 10, listen to these words. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. On that day the heavens will pass away with a loud noise. The elements will burn and be dissolved, and the earth and the works on it will be disclosed. God's judgment exposing all sin and the wrath of God being eternally poured out upon all iniquity. That's what's coming for those who do not know our Lord. So how do we live as God's people? In light of the fact that everything is coming to an end, the end of all things is near. How do we live? Well, we saw last week in verse 7 that the Bible says, Therefore be clear-headed and disciplined for prayer. And so we pray. And I tell you that when you and I really understand this great truth, that time is running out, and that all that's going to matter one of these days is our relationship with Jesus. And all that's going to matter for anybody in this world is whether or not they know Christ and whether or not they have served the Lord Jesus Christ. With that being so, with the reality being that the end of all things is on the doorstep that is imminent, what do we do? Oh, I tell you, we pray. We pray, we pray, we pray. It's in prayer that our lives are drawn into a right relationship with God. It's in prayer that we are blessed of God to be able to serve Him. It's in prayer that we draw close to the Lord. And it's that relationship with God that matters above everything else. We saw last week that we pray seriously, clear-headed, the Scripture says. And that we pray watchfully. Disciplined, be disciplined for prayer, be spiritually alert in prayer. And then this morning, notice what else we do as we live with the end in view. In verse 8, above all, keep your love for one another at full strength, since love covers a multitude of sins. That's our verse for our message this morning. I'll not read verses 9 through 11. We'll pick up there in the weeks to come. But verse 8, above everything else, keep your love for one another at full strength, 
Since love covers a multitude of sin. What are we talking about when we talk about love? What is the word love that is used in our text? The word love, contrary to Western perspectives of, of love, love is not primarily an emotion, but love is actually action. Love behaves, love acts. For God so loved the world that He gave His only born Son, His only begotten Son. And love is a, separa, a sacrificial act for the good, the blessing of somebody else. That's what love is. Secondarily, it's an emotion. Primarily, it's a commitment to the good of other people. And such a commitment that it would be sacrificial in its giving. That's what this verse of Scripture is calling us to. That's what the Bible says is the way that we are to be living knowing that the end is near. We sacrificially give of ourselves for the blessing and the benefit of other people. And here in this context, it is especially for our fellow Christians. Why? It's because the church is to be strong in the grace of God. We are to be effective in, in reaching this world for Christ. And it's in love, that heart with hearts knit together in love and serving one another in love that not only is the church edified in our faith for our own good and our own well-being, but it strengthens the church so that we can be powerfully on mission in this world. And so we are called to sacrificial love. One of the verses that I memorized early in my Christian experience was 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 15. When I read that verse uh, early in my Christian life, I don't know if it was the first time I read it or not, but early on, oh, how it powerfully spoke to my heart. And I go back and revisit that verse on a regular basis. What an example the Apostle Paul puts before us as he follows the very character, nature, and example of the Lord Jesus. Where Paul says in that verse of Scripture, I will most gladly spend and be spent for you. That's love. Notice he says there, I will gladly do. What's he saying? He says, I will wear myself out for you. I will gladly spend my energies, my time, my efforts. I will spend myself until I have nothing left to spend. I will spend and be spent up for you. And actually the verse goes on further. He says, though the more I love you, the less I be loved in return. He said, I'm going to wear myself out loving you even though you don't love me back. Wow, that's something, isn't it? Kind of reminds me of Jesus, right? Kind of, kind of reminds me of the Lord Jesus Christ Himself. Loving His enemies on the cross. Even though they were crying out for His execution and His pain and agony and finding joy in causing Christ to suffer. Paul says, I will spend myself and I will totally be spent where I have nothing left to spend for you, even though you don't love me in return. Anybody under conviction yet? I think we all should be. Love, we are called to love. Notice he implies here the importance of love in the first part of verse 8 when he uses those words, above all. He says, this is of utmost importance. This is supreme. Out of all of the things that you are to be doing in relationship to the fact that time is running out, the end of all things is at hand. Above everything else you love. Above everything else you love. And I remind you that when Jesus was questioned about the greatest commandment, He said the greatest commandment of all, of course, is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And then he gave them something they didn't ask for. He said, in the second commandment, is like unto it, you will love your neighbor as yourself. 
And upon these two commandments hang all of the law and all of the prophets. You don't find a greater instruction in the Bible than the instruction of love. Jesus said in John chapter 13, A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another like I love you. Now it's not new in that he is commanding to love, but it is new in that he says, I command you to love like I love you. You see, nobody ever loved anybody like Jesus loved when Jesus died for us on the cross. And he says, I'm commanding you to love one another the way that I have loved you. And by this will everybody know that you really are my disciples because you have this kind of love for one another. Sacrificial love where you are willing to give yourself fully for the blessing and the benefit of other people. Above all things, love. Above all things, love. Not only does he imply the importance of love here, but he talks about the fervency of love. The fervency of love. Next in this text, keep your love for one another at full strength. That's a good, that's a good way to put that in. Keep your love for one another at full strength. The Greek word that's translated full strength there is one word, and it's ektane. It literally means stretched out, sustained, strenuous effort. Stretched out love. Sustained, strenuous effort. It's not loving in a moment. It's not loving in an hour. But it is constantly given to strenuous love. Great effort love. Giving yourself sacrificially and to do that ongoingly as a lifestyle. Oh, the fervency of love that God has called us to. Do you love others that way? And as the scripture text tells us here, particularly with the application as he says one another, he's talking to Christians. He's saying love your fellow church members like this. Love the body of Christ like this. Love with a stretched out kind of love. Love with, with sustained, strenuous effort your brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ is there a need in your life this morning to be committed to that kind of love do you need to ask God today to give you the grace that you need so that you can love your fellow church members in, in that fashion I thought Lord how how is that evidenced how, how is it clearly evidenced when when we are loving the way that we ought to love. And let me just give you some practical things that came to my mind as I prayerfully sat before the Lord. Six things. First of all, if you and I are loving with this strenuous, stretched out kind of love, sustained effort of love, then you and I will cherish opportunities to be with our brothers and sisters. I mean, we would cherish opportunities. If you love someone, you look forward to being with them. Right? And the Bible says that we are to love our fellow Christians that way. And so if we love our fellow Christians like that, we look forward to being together. We look forward to having these opportunities of, of coming together and being with one another. Why? Because they are our loved ones. You know, you can have family members that you might not consider your loved ones, right? Hopefully that's not the case. Hopefully all of your family members are your loved ones. If they are truly your loved ones, then you look forward to having those opportunities of being with family. And we are family. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ is, is family. We are family. We are the church family called the Heritage Hills Baptist Church. And we are a family. And you and I should love our family. And so therefore, because we love our family, we're going to be with one another every chance that we possibly can. I tell you, I, I love my wife. I love being with Joan. I love my daughters and my sons-in-law. I love my 
grandchildren. I love my siblings. I love being with, with family. And I love being here this morning because you are my family. And I hope today that you look around about you and you see the people that you love dearly. We are to love the church because of the love of God shed abroad in our hearts for one another by the Spirit of the Lord. And then secondly, if we're loving with this kind of love, this fervent love, we'll be quick to forgive one another and we'll not be critical and judgmental. Quick to forgive. Those that you really love, you don't harbor bitterness toward them if you really love them. It doesn't matter that they did say something about you or to you that shouldn't have been said. You're still going to love them and you're going to forgive them. Why? Because you do love them. You're not going to be judgmental and critical and, and uh, distant from them. No, you're going to love them. The Bible tells us in the book of Ephesians chapter 4 verse 32 that we are to be like Christ. We're to be like God in Christ. We are to be forgiving one another. Tender hearted toward one another and forgiving one another even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you and how He has forgiven me. So we're quick to forgive, not critical and not judgmental. And then thirdly, we'll be faithful to pray for one another. Seeking the blessing of, of one another. If I love you, I want God's best for you, right? If I love you, I, I want you to be blessed. If I love you, I, I want you to have joy and completion. I want you to be fulfilled. I want you to have purpose. And so I'm going to be in your life because I want to watch you. I want to listen to you. I want to hear from you. Why? So I know how to pray for you. In love, we, we bear one another before the Lord. We pray for those that we love. And we seek God's blessings in their life and we seek for God to use us to be a blessing to them. Fourthly, I follow the fact that if we love like we ought to be loving, we won't be looking for people to meet our needs, but we'll be seeking to meet their needs. Was Jesus out for His own needs on the cross? I don't think so. He's out for your needs and my needs. And we're to follow in His example. It's not about me. You don't have to minister to me. You don't have to cater to me. If I'm loving you, I don't have demands from you to me. You don't have to wash my feet. If I love you, I'll be washing yours. Right? Love is not self-focused. That's selfishness. And the Bible says we're to be selfless. Selfless, we are to be dying to ourselves. We don't have to be patted on the back. We don't have to be applauded. We don't have to have people catering to us. They don't have to come uh, knocking on our door. They don't have to bring us uh, some banana pudding and fried chicken when we uh, haven't been feeling well lately. Why? Because it's not about us. It's about them. We're focused on the meeting of the needs of other people when we love them. We're concerned about them. We don't have to have attention. If our heart is full of love. We'll be most concerned for the spiritual well-being of other people. We love others and we've got the right belief system. And we're going to be concerned about where they are spiritually. That's what's going to really drive us in our praying for them. We want everybody to be a sincere follower of the Lord Jesus. And we want them to be growing in the grace of God. We know that when life is over for them, that what's going to really matter is when they stand before the Lord and give an account that they're able to do so with joy. That they stand before God, to God's glory, to God's honor. And if I love you, then I'm going to be concerned about your walk with Jesus. And so I'm going to be with you, and I'm going to encourage you, and I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to do what I can to help you be the, a real follower of Christ. 
or six, we'll practice what is put before us in texts like Romans chapter 12, verse 15. It says, Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. When we love people, we'll be with them emotionally. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22 says, By obedience to the truth, and the truth that, that, that uh, Peter is writing about in that text is the truth of the gospel. We obey the gospel by repenting of our sin and putting our faith in Christ as our Savior. That's obeying the truth as it would be realized in Peter's writing. He says that you have obeyed the truth, being obedient to the truth, having purified yourselves for or unto genuine love, sincere love of the brothers. Love one another earnestly from a pure heart. The picture there is like a fire of love burning in our heart for one another. Real concern, real compassion, real devotion to one another. It's to be burning strongly with us. See that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. 1 John chapter 3 verse 14 says this. We know that we have passed from death unto life. We know that we have transformed or transferred from lostness into salvation. We know we pass from spiritual death into spiritual life because we love the brethren. We love our fellow Christians. That's one of the greatest evidences that you've been saved is that you love the family of God. One of the greatest evidences that you've been saved. We know that we've been saved because God has put His love in our heart for one another. And we know we are God's family. Isn't that, isn't that precious? And so we are to love and we give ourselves to this love that God has given unto us by grace. And then finally, we see the value of love. He speaks here of the importance of love when He says above all things, love. The fervency of love is seen in those words, keep your love for one another at full strength. And then the value of love, he says, since love covers a multitude of sins. And that's a quote from the book of Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 12. Love covers a multitude of sins. Now that does not mean that we're blind to sin. The Bible tells us that we're to be concerned about each other's sins. The Bible tells us that, that when it's necessary that we are to rebuke one another because of our sins. We are to call one another to repentance. We are to be held accountable unto one another. So it's, it's, it's not an unconditional tolerance that is being spoken of here. And it's not a blindness to other sin that is being spoken of here. But rather what he is talking about here is that the sins of our fellow Christians should grieve our hearts. And instead of our glorying over their sin, we should seek the covering of God's grace and forgiveness. We should be doing what we can so that our fellow Christians will have a right relationship with God. We seek to cover them in grace and forgiveness. The Bible says in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1 that if any man be overtaken in a fault, if anyone has sinned, in a way that is obvious. When one has been overtaken in a fall, and that's put out, out generically, it could be any kind of sin, any sin whatsoever. When you know somebody is not where they ought to be with God because there is sin that has come into their experience, you which are spiritual, restore that person in the spirit of meekness or humility. Considering yourself, knowing that you yourself, you're a sinner. Considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. That your sin problem grows itself. And so we're to be aware of the sins of other people, but we're not to be looking for them. And when we do see sin in the life of a fellow Christian, instead of our running and telling somebody else, we fall to our knees and we pray for them. And we ask God to give us grace to help them. 
And we ask for the Lord to speak to their heart and to bring them to a place of real repentance. That they might be right with God. Love covers sin. It doesn't have a party and glory over the sin of others. 1 Corinthians 13 verses 5 and 6 says that love does not keep a record of wrongs. It finds no joy in unrighteousness. But it rejoices in the truth. So really, all of this is summarized in Jesus, isn't it? It's being like Christ. It's loving as Jesus would love. It's, it's sacrificially giving of ourselves. It's having our relationships with one another carried out in a fashion that reflects the heart of Christ, the crucified Christ, who would love us and give himself for us, stretched out kind of love. Stretched out on the cross, Jesus was. For you, for me. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 16 says this. This is how we have come to know love. He laid down his life for us. We should also lay down our lives for our brothers. Christ laid down his life for us. And so you and I ought to be able to look around this congregation today and everybody that we see that by the grace of God, we would be willing to lay down our life. Wow. That's what we're called to. That's, that's the way that Jesus expects us to live. That's what it means to follow Christ. And as our time ticks away, as the days continue to vanish off on the horizon, and we march toward the end of our earthly existence. And it's getting closer and closer and closer to the time for Jesus to come for us. The day of the Lord's judgment is looming for all of humanity. So how are we going to live? We're going to live on our knees and we're going to live in love. That's how we live. We live in prayer. Genuine, sincere, devout prayer, and we live with letting Jesus' love flow through our lives to other people. In light of the end, in light of the fact that it's on the doorstep, we pray and we love. Let's stand together and bow.